we're live. It's been a struggle, people. Uh, I'm I'm sure that there's a time delay, so I'm going to talk to the void. Um, we are. This is our first live stream from the new shop, and as such, we've discovered that there's a firewall keeping us from live streaming to YouTube. Uh, oh. Let me turn down my iPad. Uh, there's a firewall keeping us from streaming to YouTube on our network. So thankfully, our landlords are uh, allowing us to use their Wi-Fi right now. Uh, because of that, the camera and Katie uh, are about 20 feet away. <laughs> so fingers crossed, Wi-Fi holds up. Everything's good. Um, let's see. All right, looking good. Yes, you were live. All right, so we're, we're getting comments. Good. Uh, I've got my iPad over here. I'm going to try and keep tabs there. Uh, Katie, our new assistant digital editor, will be uh, operating and moderating and doing all that good stuff. And we're just going to have some fun. Um, really just wanted to start live streaming as a way of including the community as we get our shop together. It's an exciting thing for us to have a shop, like a dream shop, kind of up and running. But um, we wanted to allow everyone to come along for the ride. So hopefully, um, hopefully everything will be included in some of these live streams. And uh, it sounds lame, but today we're gonna set up this 14 inch Delta and Honestly, this is one of those tools that I have like an unhealthy relationship with, a connection to, we'll say, an unhealthy connection to. I love this saw. Um, it just, it performs. Uh, in the time frame between shops, it lived at Barry Dima's shop for a little while, and he brought it back, and we're ready to get using it again, but it needs a good thorough setup. So, um, so that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to start with. And in order to do that, I'm going to use Michael Fortune's. Um, here, let's go right here. I'm going to use Michael Fortune's um, article. And it is in issue 173. And we'll post a link on the website when this goes live on the website tomorrow. But five tips for better band song. And the article's a little bit of a misnomer. If you ask me, it's kind of, it's a bandsaw setup article. And I think uh, it's probably as solid of a setup as exists. And this is not the only way to set up a bandsaw. And I know it's not the way Alex Snodgrass does it. I know it's not the way, well, I guess there's, Alex Snodgrass in the world of bandsawing, and there's Michael Fortune. Um, you know, Alex has his incredible setup, and it works for him. Uh, Michael Fortune does it a different way, and I've experienced how well it worked for me when I set up my bandsaw that way. So we are going to be doing it that way. Um, so awesome. So we have Ashok from California. Um, yeah, so chats are coming in. So let's... Um, Let's get going on this. So first off, it is unplugged. Anytime you're doing anything like that, you know, unplug the saw. I have mounted the table to the trunnions, but it's not, it's not dialed in. Nothing is really set. It's moving every which way. Um, I promise you, I meant to, I can show you over here on this camera. I promise you, I meant to clean these wheels before we got started. There's some pitch on there, but um, we had internet issues and that took up all of my extra time. So we're gonna run with it like this. I'm not that scared. It would look like this in 10 minutes regardless after we set it up. Uh, I was going to vacuum the whole thing out. Didn't do that either. So there's plenty of, this is real world use. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is I know that these wheels are coplanar. These, these wheels have been coplanar for 20 or 30 years. If this was a brand new to me bandsaw, before I put the table on, I would check the wheels being coplanar with a level. 
Um, I know in my heart of hearts that this is fine. So we're going to skip that step. Um, I'm going to put a blade on, and I have a brand new blade. Um, this one is from uh, Olson. It's their all pro PGT. Um, this is a half inch blade. I thought we had a quarter inch blade around because that's really what I want on there. Let's see. We don't. We're going with a half inch. That's the way it's going to go, people. So um, this will eventually have a quarter inch blade on it because the Rikon is going to get set up with a three quarter inch uh, resaw blade. And I'd rather them be a little bit further apart. But pulling out this three quarter inch blade, fun fact, these Olsen blades are made um, five miles down the road in Bethel, Connecticut. And when I worked at a hardware store, four and a half miles down the road in Bethel, Connecticut, Olson and or the parent company Blackstone Industries, they came in and bought stuff from the hardware store all the time. And I never knew that it was a big old blade manufacturer. Um, so they manufacture Olson, they manufacture Zona, like the razor saws. I should really be using gloves right now, but I didn't. Um, so, and I got it flipped inside out and I'll show you you got to make sure that as the as the blade is on, the teeth are coming down, that the teeth are pointing down, right? If you unfold it wrong, that's not going to happen. So now the teeth are going to come down into the wood and cut the wood. I don't want to tell you how many times, well, it's probably only been two or three times that I've installed a bandsaw blade and had it on the wrong way and you feel like an idiot. But... You learn to check that. I'm gonna pull out this throat plate. Let me, Katie. Let me know if I need to move a camera or, or get closer on something. Just don't be shy. Okay. Um, all right. So we get it in here. This is always the least fun part. And I'm going to come down, get it in the, in the guide blocks, right? So if you see up here, this saw has old school guide blocks. Um, they're just ceramic guides. Uh, same thing on the bottom. Trust me on that. I'll get the camera down there eventually, but um, it's not really necessary right now. So we got the blade on. Just giving everything a good look. And second camera might need more light. Second camera might need more light. Let me see what I can do about that. Um, hmm. Function. Nope, that's the other one. These are new cameras to me too, so I don't know how to get them going as fast. Tell you what, we are going to roll with what we have now, unless I go yeah, to. Yeah, you know what? Let me um tell you what. Let's move the saw a little and not tip it over. Hey, watch this. I am not grabbing it by the table. Never, ever, ever move a bandsaw by the table because everything we are about to do, even though this isn't set up, I'm not going to grab it by the table just out of habit. Everything we're about to do after a bandsaw is set up, you grab it by the table, out the window. It's gone. So don't do that. Let's move the bandsaw. Oh, these stupid casters. That's worse, isn't it? There's windows everywhere, people. I'm sorry. All right, we're gonna roll with that. Um, 
Any uh, sec camera needs more light? Uh, Ashok, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, the wheels do be coplanar. Um, they need to be in the same alignment this way. You don't have to worry about the top wheel with the rotation right now, because we're going to dial that in when we track the blade. But if one wheel is over here and one wheel's here, that isn't going to want to track between the two of them. So you want to make sure that the wheels are coplanar that way. I know that these wheels are, so I'm not going to worry about it. I don't think I've ever had a bandsaw wind up not coplanar though. A good saw is really manufactured that way. So I'm just adding some tension right now with this wheel up here. And if you look, let me zoom in and see if that helps with the light situation. So I'm gonna dial up the tension and I'm gonna always for a while rotate backwards on the wheels because if something is going weird and I'm rotating forwards clockwise, the teeth are gonna hit something. If something is weird right now and I'm rotating backwards, they're still gonna hit, but it's not gonna be a blunt force hit. Um, so I'm just gonna add some tension, get us dialed in a bit and see where we lie. So the blade is honestly tracking pretty well right now. Look down here, do the same thing. Um, I'm not, another thing I'm looking for is just to make sure that the blade is not hitting any of the little latches, just making sure everything is functioning freely. Um, so that's, that's it. Let's see. Must be how to do it right now. Thanks for trying guys. Um, yeah, long, long straight edge. Uh, I use bevel and I take the, the table off. Um, but a long straight edge, you could use an edge of plywood, uh, as long as you know it's straight and just hold it against this two points here and two points there. And that should get you there for a coplanar. Um, all right, let's see. So I'm going to move this second camera down and we're going to look at the bottom bearings. Okay. So, are you on this one? Okay. Um, if you look, the bearings, there's, there's three main bearings to any uh, bandsaw. And let me just wiggle this around. You've got your two side bearings and your back thrust bearing, right? And if you look, as that blade is tracking, I'm already hitting that thrust bearing. So I need to back that off. I need to move the whole thing back and I'm gonna move this camera real quick so that I can get to it. So on this saw, this one, this bottom knob moves the side bearings back and forth. And this top knob moves that thrust bearing back. What I'm gonna do is I wanna get those really out of the way right now. I want to make sure that they're not changing the, the tracking of this blade and pushing the blade forward. So that looks good to me. Now I'm going to do the same thing on the top real quick. Okay, and let me move this camera back up. Okay, uh, sorry about the backlighting, but as you can see, this blade does not want to be in that, in that bearing right now. So one thing I want to do is 
make sure that the bearing assembly is where it's going to go. That's where it's going to go. I think once I get more tension on this blade, It does not want to dial in. Well, huh, this one's new to me. I've never had this happen on this saw. How are we doing over here? Turn the nozzle, yeah. Yeah, so on the bottom, there is the knobs on the bottom. They're different on every saw. You can remove the, the blade from the trunnions or you can, move, you can remove the trunnions altogether. Yeah. Just joined. Uh, Phil, yeah, we, we talked about removing the table. We're not going on this one because the wheels are coplanar. But we are going to adjust the table. And this... What is going on here? There's no way of moving this assembly over. You know what I'm gonna do is just double check that this is in the right spot and it's not. There we go. So are we still seeing the bearings? We good there, Katie? Okay. Um, back here, I can move the whole assembly and I want to get that as lined up as best I can and cranked down. And that's, that's what wasn't happy there for a while. The bottom, the bottom assembly is, is good. That didn't move in shipping, if you will. So, now everything is running smoothly. Nothing is hitting. And now is the time to check the dial on the back and make sure that we've got, that we are tensioned. I like to go to, I like to do what Michael Fortune taught me to do, and tension it to the gauge. And I could use a little bit more. This saw is probably maxing out with this half inch blade. Move that guide block. Set a little bit more. Okay. So, now, how are we doing on comments? Tuning video. Do you know where to buy replacement guide bearings for the bottom guide? Um, you know, I, I've seen them in Woodcraft. I know Olsen sells them. Um, I bought for, for my bandsaw at home, I bought mine from Grizzly. Um, Carter, I believe, makes some. Uh, kind of an industry standard is a, uh, it's, I don't know who makes them, but it's They're called cool blocks. Uh, I like the ceramic guide blocks. Um, I swapped my Grizzly at home. I swapped my bearings over from, I had uh, roller bearings and I didn't like them. Um, and I swapped them over to a regular guide block bearing assembly. And in doing so, I bought um, Grizzly Salt. They were plastic. I don't think I realized that they were plastic or they're some sort of um, composite. And I'm not big on the composite ones. I like the ceramic ones. I've seen people use wood ones. Um, yeah. So, okay, for Chapman, for those who don't have a tension gauge on their saw, it would be cool to see the deflection I heard about on STL, Shop Talk Live. Um, yeah, so right now I am deflecting it and I've never, I've never been able to say, oh yeah, that feels perfect. 
I know if it's too much. I know if it's too little, but I know if I'm pushing it, there's no way of describing it. That's why I don't really like thinking about it from a deflection standpoint, just because how do you describe how hard you push? You know, I've heard people say, oh, when the when your finger turns white, it should be deflected a quarter of an hour. I, I don't know how to define that amount of deflection. Um, I've always just gotten it until it feels right, and then I see how the saw acts. And if the blade needs more tension, you'll know. Um, and that's also why I like to use the, the guide on the back of the saw, because it gives me a known quantity. Now, yes, the spring, the spring wears out over time, blah, blah, blah. It's never, never really gotten in the way for me. I'm sure other people have um, other, yeah, so Dee's asked, can you show the finger test? I, I, I could show the finger test if I knew exactly how to do the finger test. I don't, I will say this, if anyone is that concerned about the tension on your bandsaw blade, there is a gentleman in Maine and uh, tomorrow when we post this to the website, I need to remember to post, uh, I think it's called Easy Tension. It's like a little plastic gauge and it's genius how he came up with it. Um, but uh, it is magnets that hold onto the blade and, they, and it can test the deflection for how far off the blade is bent around a post, right? And when, it, when you crank that tension knob, once it hits a tipping point, the magnet will let go. And it's a simple tool. I keep meaning to buy one for myself because I do like knowing, um, I do really like knowing that it's dialed into a repeatable level and I'm gonna buy one for myself. I just, and they're not expensive at all. So um, that's on my wish list, we'll say. So we're good there. I'm spinning the blade fast and I'm not worried about it right now. Again, I'm spinning it backwards. I like spinning it backwards for as long as I can. So let's talk about tracking on the blade. Let me get the camera up a little bit higher. Um, Michael Fortune, my particular bandsaw guru, says blade tracking doesn't matter on the bottom. And if that's what Michael Fortune says, that's what it is. So you can't really tell from this angle, but the blade is centered, the whole blade. Um, I don't have a tape measure. The, this blade, the entirety of this blade is teeth and all exactly half an inch, right? I want that whole half of an inch to be centered on this wheel. And I know a lot of people will say, you want the teeth, the back of the gullet centered on the wheel. If that works for you, keep doing it. This works for me, this works for Michael Fortune, this is what I'm going with, all right? The whole blade is centered on the wheel. And one really great thing about that is this wheel is crowned. So there's a ridge to the surface. So if that blade is centered on that wheel, the teeth have some relief, right? And the teeth should not be digging in, into that crowned wheel, that crowned tire. This is a urethane tire on here. So what I'm gonna do right now is come around here and not trip over cables. And I am going to mess up the tracking on this. And what I'm doing here is there's a knob on the back of here that is pushing on the bearing assembly and tilting this top blade. So look, did you see that move? Katie's saying yes. So I'm gonna go the other way with it. Oh, wrong way. So look, that blade is now coming over, it's cresting over. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna tighten that knob and that blade moves back on the wheel. Let's see if I can too far. This one's just a thumb knob, so it's, it's kind of hard to get the tension. But that blade is now going a little too far in the other direction, so it just so happened to be in the right spot. It is centered on that wheel. I'm pretty happy there. 
again, I'm going to just open up the bottom and look and double check that we're not really hitting anything. And mainly, the reason why I'm doing this is I want to make sure that this blade is running true by itself without anything else in the way. This blade should be going smoothly on its own. And, you know, if the blade is running true without the bearings in the way, without anything in the way, without anything forcing it there, that's when I have found it works the best for me. So um, I'm going to move this camera back down and we're going to dial in the bottom bearings. Up, 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 up. How's that? Okay. This is awkward. I have a camera in my way and I messed up my knee so I can't kneel. Um, all right, so. I'm gonna loosen up these guide blocks. Easy tension, like E Z. Yeah. Okay. And who makes it? I think it's Daily Dovetail on Instagram. Um, do you know Rick? This is super awkward. I'll look through the top. Oh, come on. Okay. Bottom guides, they get dialed in once and then forgotten about, and this is why. All right, so. The bottom, I have a tendency of setting them a little looser. I'm just going to kind of be within a sixteenth of an inch, a shy sixteenth of an inch, because I really just want to make sure that they're not hitting unnecessarily. And now, and I'll really show you where I set them on the top bearings because you'll be able to see it. This is, I'm not going to be able to get a good, a good um, shot for you here. Our goal, I should have said that right off the bat. Thank you, Blue 93201. <laughs> or whatever, I'm sorry. Blue Tuna Tiger One. That's my new favorite username. It should be 90 degrees to a fence. I do not want to track, I do not want to set drift on a fence. I know that goes against what a lot of people say, and a lot of people spend a lot of money on alignable rip fences. Um, if a bandsaw is dialed in, you do not need to worry about setting your fence for drift. With a, with a sharp blade, you don't need to worry about it. But sometimes it's necessary. I know my goal is going to be to get this to work at 90. Um, that's just the way I prefer it. So, now, I'm going to move these. Can you see that? Yeah. All right, I'm moving these blocks up to about the back of the gullet, the tooth gullet. And then if you look on the back here, this is the thrust bearing. 
this is what kicks in as the blade gets starts moving and starts getting tension put on it. I'm going to start spinning that blade. All right, I do not want it to spin on its own. That means it is coming in contact with the blade before anything else and is now changing how the blade is running. All right, I'm going the wrong way. This one's backwards from mine at home. There we go. So the only thing, and you might be able to hear it, that's, there, there is some, there's a brush back here. Um, that's what I'm hearing. And it keeps, I don't have one on mine at home. So it keeps making me feel weird. All right. That bottom assembly is good in my book. And it is likely I will not look at it again until it is moved. Let's dial in the top assembly. Sorry for all the moving of the camera. I just can't figure out another way of doing it. That's my signal to go outside and get my son from the bus when I'm working from home. All right, so bottom or top assembly. Same thing, only different, only you can actually see what you're doing. Loosen everything up, everything's backed off. I'm gonna move this, this housing. Come on, what's going on there? Why are you being weird? Come on. Hmm. That doesn't want to spin. There we go. Manufacturer's name just appears to be Easy Tension LLC. Well, it is a He's a dude up in Maine, uh, tied to Center for Furniture Craftsmanship. So you know he's got game. And um, he, I believe he makes them there. And it's just such a cool product. So I'm gonna back these guide blocks off. And of course, it's a different Allen key. You're joking. That's annoying. This Allen key works here, and this Allen key works there. Okay. Don't know what's going on there. So these are backed off, nice and loose. I'm gonna move them up again to just behind the blade, the T, right? And once I tighten that down, then they move again. So I got it. I got it behind the teeth. Tighten that assembly block down. Now, Barry Dima, our associate editor, got some organic hemp rolling papers. I don't know if he had them. I don't know. But people use these as a way of setting the tension on these guide blocks. I've never used them before. It's really thin. I've, I've used a dollar bill before because I have it in my pocket. Um, I like to use what I have lying around. But these can, these are there. Yeah, that actually looks just about right. So I'm gonna move this camera real quick. Okay, so Caleb asks about replacing the thrust bearing. This bearing should be something you can get off 
McMaster or whatever. They are fairly generic. Um, this is the thrust bearing. Um, I, when I replaced my bearings on my Grizzly, I think I kept the thrust bearing. I, I don't think I replaced it. Um, this should be an easy, ta an easy one to find, especially at Delta. Um, you know, Delta kind of set the the industry standard for these saws, for this style of saw, and they're generally all the same. But um, it shouldn't be a hard thing. But if this thrust bearing is frozen, or if it, when you spin it by hand, if it is rough feeling at all, yeah, you got to replace it. Um, I know Mike's thrust bearing on the bot on his bottom guide is totally frozen and uh, doesn't spin at all. I know that the roller bearings on my bottom guide, on my Grizzly, when I replaced this the whole assembly, one of them was frozen, like frozen solid, and that's not doing any bit of good. I feel like the roller bearings, when they go, they really go, and they're a problem. Um, but it is what it is. And I, a lot of people love those roller bearings. I just didn't get along with it personally. So, all right, so we are dialed in with here. We're one rolling paper away from the blade. Um, or one dollar bill works too. I kind of just set mine by eye. It's like real stinking close. That's my measurement. Um, and then I'm gonna do the same thing with this thrust bearing. I'm gonna bring it up until it's until it touches. Now that's too far. So dial it back and that's about it that's pretty much it now um we've got our guide bearing set we've got our thrust bearing set and we should be good with this whole thing now we need to dial in the table um so let's go ahead and do that let me clear some stuff out of the way I'm going to put the throw plate in, and I'm actually going to drop and I should note, drop that assembly to about where it's going to go before you dial it in. I should have lowered that before I dialed it in because we're probably, no, we're good. We're still good. We're still good on this one. Um, not all saws stay true in line as well as this one is right now. So... Um, all right, how are we doing on comments? I'm not enjoying my Delta because the, the thrust bearings are frozen. That's gonna, that's gonna do everything for you. Once you get these bearings dialed in, I'm telling you, these Deltas, you can't, you can't go wrong with them. And I'm gonna go further and say, the, all the Delta knockoffs, I'm sure there's some bad ones out there my Grizzly, I have an 055 LX at home. Um, it's, it looks like this, but painted green, right? Um, it's so simple. They're set, they're simple machines. So once you figure out what needs to be replaced and get it dialed in, I think you're, and put a sharp blade on it, I think you're gonna have a beast of a saw. You're gonna love it. So uh, yeah, good luck with that, Caleb. Um, Kind of like leveling a 3D printer, Chapman. I feel ya. I feel ya. Leveling a 3D... I would much rather do this than level a 3D printer. I went to... Oh, I had... Yeah, I love my 3D printer, though. And one thing, speaking of 3D printers, maybe we can do a video or something on it. I printed a dust shroud for my Grizzly uh, that hooks up to the very bottom right on top of the assembly block and for dust collection if you have access to a 3d printer that's like the second thing you should print print something stupid then print a dust shroud for your bandsaw oh they're great um all right so we're good there we're good there now we're gonna do the thing i'm gonna plug it in <laughs> Oh, 
that out. Let's paint it over. Come on. I can't unplug that one. I'm going to get a cord. Hang on. We're going live. This, uh, this shop has been, setting it up has been a frustrating experience, as frustrating as exhilarating. It's uh, finding all of the quirks of the building bit by bit. Always a good time. All right, so we're good there. Get this camera out of the way in case something blows up. Um, I'm going to turn it on real quick. I'm going to turn it off real quick, right? Okay. All right. We didn't hear any squealing. We didn't hear any clunky and clunk and the blade come flying off. We didn't hear anything weird, right? So now I'm going to do the same thing. Let me move the camera right over here. That's just a bad, you can see the, let me zoom out. Nope. I'm going to leave the door open just a hair. And this is really convenient. I can be out of the way and I can watch the camera and look at the tracking. I highly recommend that. That was super convenient. Set up a camera and watch your tracking from a safe position. Yeah, so the blade's tracking good. The bearings are good. Um, I'm going to do one more look under with it running just to make sure the bottom bearings are good. You know what I might do real quick? No, we're good. And I'm, let me get the camera in right here while I do the bottom, while I look at the bottom bearing. So you can really see that now, right? It's coming. Is it? Sorry. Come on. Nothing's touching. All right. I'm going to go find a piece of wood. Make a cot. I'm going to use this one. All right. So you want to set your muscle memory, people. My saw at home has two knobs, and I automatically go to grab for the other knob. You want your, your guide blocks right above the workpiece. It's safety and accuracy, right? Um, so. Could you all hear that? They are safety glasses. Yes, I got prescription safety glasses. I should have the side things, I know. Quick question, my tensioner screw is bottoming out on my old Rockwell Model 14. Do you know how I can fix it without having to loosen everything and risk having a heap of metal? You're not gonna lose, you're not gonna have a heap of metal. If, if your screw is bottoming out, I would be willing to bet, I'm sure somebody in the comments can back me up on this, I'm willing to bet that you need to replace that spring, that tension spring. Um, you should not be bottoming out. Uh, yeah, let's see, kind of like leveling, okay. All right, so I think I'm caught up. Um, all right, so you heard that noise? That's one thing about these saws. This, this 
That was that was this uh, top top of the body. It's sheet metal, kind of does what it wants to sometimes. This one we're missing a knob on. I, I didn't know about it until yesterday, but I gotta get that fixed or make one or something. But um, that's what's going on there. So, all right, let's do a test cut. That blade's killing. I mean, it's just a two by four, but that is a smooth cut. Um, sharp blade. There's like no joy like a sharp, a brand new blade on a bandsaw. It's just, mm, it's heaven. All right. <clears throat> so we've got that dialed in. Now we bring the fence into the equation. And this is where some of you are going to like really lose it and, and, really disagree with me. And that's okay. If whatever you're doing works, you keep doing it. If you have another method and you're getting good results, great. If you're having, if you have another method and you're not getting good results, try this one. Michael's fortunes setup blew my mind on this. And he takes into equation something else that no one else has done as far as I know before. And it made all of the difference in the world for me. Now, again, at home, I have a Grizzly 055 LX. It is not a fancy saw. It is a saw just like this one, bigger motor. And I get it dialed in, and I can resaw seven or eight inches fine with it, like totally fine. It's so just if you're if you're having troubles. Try this out, okay? So we're gonna add the fence into the equation. And um, I'm gonna go get another piece of poplar. Hang tight. Sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, how do I change the spring? Does anyone know how to unscrew the tensioner all the way and all the way and just put it on? That I I've, I've never done it, so I can't say yes or no. Um, I'd be willing to bet there's a YouTube video. He must have previously selected an unpopular board. These are cutoffs from the trim around the shop um, that no one has claimed. And yeah, that's always the fun thing about this shop in particular. There's boards lying all over the place and you go like, Am I, can I use this? Does anyone have dibs on this or whatever? So we have to get back into the habit of labeling boards and I'm just pretty sure that these are unspoken for. All right, so we've got our uh, fence right here. And this is actually a bad side to use for it. I'm gonna, I don't have a miter gauge, do I? Oh well, that's okay. Um, first thing I'm gonna do is I am going to just do a cut and see how it's acting, right? Uh, now lower the block, again, same thing. What I'm looking for is this. So right, I'll be honest with you, there was a time when um, even on our podcast, some people said drift is, is not a thing. Drift doesn't exist. And I remember sitting at home in Nashville with my bandsaw and saying, you're wrong. Drift does exist. Um, 
there's there's a there's one I'm about to show you though should get rid of that drift if you have a sharp blade. Um, and if you do not have a sharp blade, you always start there. If you have a sharp blade and you're still getting drift, check this out. So as I push it, if it starts pulling away, or or if the blade starts wandering, that will be drift, right? So. It was totally fine. There's no drift, of course. Um, it, it, it was totally fine, but I'm going to add drift because I love you all. So I'm going to move this camera around the back. Okay, Katie. What? What causes drift is, I'm going to raise this up to an unsafe level. Is the back of the blade. Let's see how close I can get that. Sorry, it just doesn't like it all the way in. The back of the blade hitting the cut. So if I pull this blade over you can, and that back of the blade was hitting that cut, what it's gonna do, there's nothing else for it to do but to push the, the board out of the way. That back of the blade wants to be unfettered. The only thing touching the wood absolutely 100% should be the teeth of the blade. Once that kerf is cut, the teeth are thicker than the blade because there's, there's set to them. So, so the teeth are cut and then pushed off in either direction. There should be room for that wood to go. If the back of your blade, and it'll be obvious on a half inch blade, but if the back of your blade is, is hitting that, it is absolutely going to drift. And I'll prove again, I'll do, I'll do a cut right now, freehand. And you'll see, I can follow a line, if I can make a line. You'll see I can follow a line, no problem probably right now. That was awful. Hang on, let me do it this way. All right, uh, I'm not gonna move the close camera, but you'll see, you'll be able to see it on the wide shot if I'm having to move the board this way or that way to go straight. I didn't have one bit of problem following that line. Now, I am going to move the table in relation to the blade askew, right? So what that's gonna do is that is going to, when the fence is, is in play, it's going to, the back of the blade is going to hit the, the, the board. Uh, let me figure out which way I want to do it. I'm going to move this way. So there's two bolts on these trunnions. Oh, there's more. Get this other one. There's two on each, oh, there's three on each trunnion. There we go. Come on. 
So I'm going to loosen all six right now. And I'm going to move this this table in relation to the blade. So you, can you see it on the tight shot where that table is getting skewed to that blade? Now, for now, I'm just gonna tighten two of them and I'm gonna actually go the right direction with it. How are we doing over here? Where can we buy one? Do you ever stone the back of the blade? No, I've never done that. I, I don't know if it's time for that. Um, I've heard of that. And uh, I think Raleigh Johnson does it. I think he just kisses it with sandpaper. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I don't really remember the reason why. Where can we buy that? What are they talking about? The <laughs> Ray, we seem to be unprepared for a demonstration video. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm demonstrating this bandsaw. So. Let's see. Let's see what we got the trend means were. Not tight on the saw. All right. Let's see if I whacked, if I knocked out a whack. Not enough. So you can see it's starting to kiss the back of the blade. This blade, this these Olsons make a nice a nice kerf. Um, it's it's a thick kerf, but um, so I'm gonna have to really go go out to make this one happen. That should be an obnoxious amount. And just so that you know, Ray, I'm taking a perfectly good saw and breaking it now. Or not breaking it, but I do this for you. I gotta go even more. Not quite enough. Sorry, this saw just does not want to drift. That should be an absolutely absurd amount. can hear it.
You can, you can barely see it, but in order for me to cut straight, <laughs> this blade doesn't want to drift. I apologize. In order for me to cut straight, I had to tilt the board over. Not all that much. This this blade, this this is just for the record. This is an Olsen half-inch wide 3 TPI. Um 0.025 thick rake or hook tooth set to rakers. So uh, I really like these blades. They are, they take a little bit more of a curve than other ones. And that's showing up right now. This blade does not want to drift at all uh, without me going to an absurd level with it. But um, let me, Dial it back in real quick. There we go. To where it was. Okay. I got that one tight. I'm going to do one more real tight. New board. And let me cut it with the fence first. That edge is not true. That edge is a little bit better. So now without the fence in place, I am going to do another cut and see, and this will be exaggerated now, see where I have to push it in order to go straight. I'm going to go a quarter of an inch from that line. I moved it right at the very end. I was trying to hold it in place to bring the fence up to it so you could see. But it's pretty much dead on. Uh, I didn't have any problem at all following that line, if you could see that. I was able to follow it pretty, pretty dang straight. So let's see. What do we have going on here? Turn on bandsaw, rubbing a piece of steel on one side. Oh, okay, so you're talking, David's talking about stoning the blade, yeah. Um, okay, so if, yeah, if you've got a carbide blade that is jumping around, turn on, yeah. So um, I, I know that, you know, Raleigh Johnson's book has a whole set on um, stoning a blade probably, and we should try and get that online sometime, Katie. Um, all right, let's do a little bit of resaw. Hey, Ms. Chapman's joke where he said, confirmed drift doesn't exist, but is clearly paid by big bandsaw <laughs> to make us five. <laughs> I am paid by big bandsaw, yes, yes. Uh, Olsen is... We bought these blades, I swear. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've had really good luck with Olsen blades. Um, and like this is to me just proving it right now, a brand new blade on a reasonably dialed in saw. It's, it's really, really hard to go wrong. Keep in mind though, you gotta be willing to throw $20 out the window the second it starts getting weird and throw another blade on. And it's just, that's one thing I love about like a quarter inch, um, 95 inch blade for a Delta like this, 
just it's 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 not nothing but 15 20 dollars to get a true cutting saw it's really hard to argue with that so um all right we're going to do a little bit of resaw here I said before, right at the start of this, I said how much I love the saw. That is true, but I hate this fence. All right. Absolutely killing it. It's just, it was, hang on, can you see that? That was perfectly straight. Uncomfortable up, uh, what was the Wayne's World? Uncomfortable close up where they would zoom. Uh, you're too young for Wayne's World. <laughs> <laughs> Katie makes me feel really old. <laughs> uh, so that is setting up this bandsaw. Um, Ben, are you in the four-stroke gang? I don't know what that means. What is, the, are you in the four-stroke gang? Totally got me there. Totally got me there, big screen. Big screen bird, I like that. So um, yeah, is there any other questions? Anything y'all wanna talk about? We're here for a little bit. Horsepower of this motor. It's not big. I can't, oh, can I see? I can't see, hang on. This is getting weird, people. I have no idea, it's probably, it's probably a horse and a half, I'd be willing to bet. It's not a big motor at all. It's a 110. Um, 110 saw, horse and a half at best. If not a horse, it's an older one or an 80s. <sighs> Should I put riser blocks on my Delta for more resaw? <sighs> um, Caleb, that is a fantastic question. And... That's one of those ones that you can answer and only you. I'll say this. I have I have a riser block on my Grizzly. And um, was that cut plumb? That's a good question. Sorry. So let me talk about that um, while I get a square. Oh, look at you. You're right. And you want to know why that cut wasn't plumb? You want to know why that cut wasn't plumb? I didn't square the table. I didn't square the table, man, Tony. So that's why that cut wasn't plumb. It's probably exactly where that cut table was, which if you look, is going to be nowhere near square. You got that on the other camera? Okay, yeah. So skip to step. That's what you get for live streaming. That's not quite long enough. Oh well. So another thing that it would be really good for me to do is to, oh, the stop is set wrong. Okay, so there's a stop. Let me move, let me move this. And while I'm dialing it in, I'm moving this camera, obviously. While I'm dialing it in, I will talk about riser blocks and my complicated feelings on them. Um, so, you can see the stop right here. That's what brings, that's what stops the table when 
you're going to 90. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the table to 90 with the square or close to it. And try not to reference off the teeth, reference off the back of the blade. And now I'm going to tighten that stop up. And that is something that never trust to stop 100%. So, all right, riser blocks. Um, on a 14 inch saw, one thing people think is they're gonna get a riser block and they'll have, they'll be able to resaw 12 inches with it. So for those who don't know, a riser block goes it's just a cast iron block that goes in between this joint here and raise the whole saw, the whole top assembly of the saw up another six inches. And a good riser block kit will come with a guard. Um, this, this guard needs to be replaced here and then a guard on the right side, on the uh, bearing side. So in theory, you get 12 inches of resaw with it. Um, in practice, you're never gonna get 12 inches of resaw with it. And because a 14 inch saw is unlikely to have enough power to cut through 12 inches of, um, of material and a 95 inch blade is going to heat up way too much over the course of, of that cut as well. I have experienced if I resaw eight inches or nine inches, I have experienced that it starts off just fine. I'm going real slow with it. I'm, you know, really taking my time. It starts off just fine, but that half inch blade isn't big enough to disperse the heat um, of that cut. And the whole thing starts loosening. I swear to God, you can feel it. You can feel that blade lengthen and start to hit, start to really whip itself into that cut. Um, so, and this is something I learned from Tim Rousseau, um, another guy up in Maine, um, that those, those smaller blades, a half inch blade just does not have enough mass to it to, to, to disperse that heat or to handle the heat of a resaw. And, um, so I have a riser block on my saw and honestly, the only reason why I do is so that I can resaw seven inches or seven and a half inches. I'm not going to pretend I can resaw 12 inches for one minute. Um, if you um, if you work uh, on something that is, you know, if you have an eight inch joiner, I think it's worth it because you're going to use eight inches of stock from time to time. Um, I go I go 50 50 on it. My brother just bought a used Delta, like just just like this saw, and I told him not to worry about it. Um, because we have a big old Rikon that I can resaw with if, if he needs to sometime. But um, let's see, beam strength increases with thicker blade. Uh, yeah, everything, right, David? Everything's going <laughs> to increase with a thicker price as well. But um, yeah, it's it, it really makes sense that that blade is going to heat up, and, and when it heats up, it's going to get longer. Um, and your cut just goes right down the hill once that starts happening. It's like no matter how slow you go, that blade's not gonna come back down to, to temperature and it's therefore not gonna shrink back up until you stop. Um, so I do resaw eight or nine inches with it, but I assume that I'm not going to get a good cut that way. Um, let's see, what do I do for dust collection? This saw has a little dust shroud that goes on right here um, that we hook up a, a shop back directly to and it does okay. Um, I think at one point somebody added a four inch port. Maybe it was on a different saw. I remember seeing a video with a saw that looked like this that somebody added a four inch port on. And I've never had much luck with a four inch port on the front here. Um, I have a dust shroud on my saw that I 3D printed that goes right up under there. And it basically, gets that hose right under the cut. And that does a really good job with dust collection. It's not lights out. Um, 
I don't think anything creates dust more in my personal shop as fast as the bandsaw. So uh, let's see. Riser block. Uh, Chapman says, from what he's seen, riser block is usually a bad idea unless you upgrade the motor. Yeah, you know, I agree with you, Chapman, um, but I, I don't think that the motor is necessarily the biggest weak spot. I think the blade size is in those regards. So um, were there any questions came in? Chapman, yeah, there's the confirmed drift. Back of the blade, same paper, let's see. Caleb, what fence is that? This is, I think, the fence that came with it. Um, it is just a regular old, no features added fence. Uh, there's a piece of Baltic birch stuck onto it, and that's about it. Uh, it's fine, it's a little hard to dial in precisely. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I think we're good. Anything else, people? The band wheel should increase as well. My bandsaw doesn't. Your bandsaw doesn't have a fence. That stinks. Um, I know Michael Fortune puts um, Craig fences on all of his saws. And we'll post a link tomorrow to this um, this video, or you can find it on YouTube. It's it's one of our more popular YouTube videos. It's um, it's Michael Fortune. If you do Michael Fortune bandsaw on YouTube, you'll find this video, and it's basically a nine minute version of this hour and fifteen minute long live stream you poorly just sat through. Um, but he dials it in, and you'll see he does it on a rigid bandsaw, and he gets it dialed in. And I know a lot of people really talk poorly on those rigid bandsaws and he loves his and um, he has it working great. He puts Craig fences on all of his saws. Um, so uh, you might want to look at that. It's a good investment. They're not super cheap. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, people who make fences for the bandsaw. Um, I think if you're going to buy a fence, unpopular opinion, if you're going to buy a fence, try and get um, try and just go with one that doesn't have the drift mechanism added into it. I um, I have been struggling with uh, with the fence on this one, uh, honestly, just because I don't know it. I I need to pull out the manual and read it and really figure out what's going on with the fence. But um, as I go to cut, I keep grabbing the wrong knob, and um, that's that's a me problem I know, but um, there's definitely, uh, simple is better a lot of times for me. Um, a good article on fine woodworking for building a fence. Yeah, I think there's been a few. Um, I think Asa Cristiano will, uh, you know, next time, Katie, we need to have a note book over there and like talk about the articles to link to. Um, we're learning, but uh, yeah, there's definitely, def there's definitely ways of building fences, so. Uh, well, I guess I might do it. Anybody have any last minute questions about bandsaws, whatever, anything else? Uh, now's your chance. Um, I'm going to take a sip of water real quick. And, um, so yeah, we're really psyched to have this saw going again. Now I need to dial in the Rikon. And uh, I've got a couple of wood slicer blades on order from Highland for that saw. Um, and we'll, we'll be in bandsaw nirvana here. Um, I love having a 14 inch. I love having, this is a 16 inch um, set up for different things. And it's great to have two. Uh, but if you only have one, I don't think you can go wrong with a 14 inch cast iron. They're cheap. Um, my brother got one for 250 I think a few months ago, and I was really mad at him about it. But yeah, all right, well, uh, thanks for coming, Caleb, and Blue Tuna Tiger, and Chapman, and David Grando, Grandu, um, and Jim Mitchell, Ray Peterson, Dances with Aardvarks, <laughs> yeah, Jay Gee, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of you, which is, this has been fun. We are probably gonna do these, we're gonna 
we're going to screw around with this and do them every other week. Next week, um, what do you want to see? What do you want to see? What do you want me to do? Um, why don't you tell me what you want to see, and we'll make it happen uh, two weeks from now. Um, we're going to be doing a tool wall uh, on Friday. We're not going to do that live. Katie's going to film it, and we'll be making a video for YouTube on that. Um, we've got that to do. We've got, you know what I kind of want to do on a live stream or on something? Uh, a drill press table with a fence. And we have a killer grizzly drill press. It's a beast. And um, that will be, it needs a table. It needs a wooden table added to it. So that might be a live stream. Uh, we'll see. But uh, thank you all for coming. And we'll be doing more of these. And let people know if you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, thanks a lot.